I'm Shweta. I have over 16 years of experience in IT and software. So my name is Jeff Burke. I'm a senior cloud solutions architect at Sunadi. My name is Alistair. I am a contract senior DevOps and platform engineer working for the UK government. My name is Janet Ram MSV. I am based out of Hyderabad, India. I am an advisor to startups. I'm also an architect helping SaaS companies move to microservices and helping them with the scalability. I'm also a market research analyst, publishing content at Forbes and a couple of other publications. My background includes working for Microsoft and Amazon Web Services. And for the last decade or so, I have been an independent analyst and advisor and architect. So with that, I want to share my screen and get started with the presentation. So I understand we have a mixed set of audiences coming from a variety of backgrounds. Some of you are switching the career to DevOps and cloud. Some of you are already familiar with cloud and DevOps, and of course, microservices and containers. So I'm going to keep this slide here at a high level and give you a thorough overview of what is software supply chain and what do you mean by securing this? The objective of this webinar is to help you understand what is software supply chain and what do you need to secure the supply chain and some of the tools that I want to touch upon, like DevOps landscape, the supply chain security landscape is also flooded with uh, many tools. It's up to you on what you want to choose. So I'm going to touch upon one of my favorite tools that I typically use to secure and analyze the software supply chain. And then I have a couple of demos to drive the point across. So let's get started. Now, before we take a closer look at the software supply chain, I want to set this stage by explaining you or doing a quick refresher and a recap of what is supply chain. Most of us are familiar with the supply chain, but let's do a quick recap. And based on these concepts, we'll uh, try to map the traditional supply chain to software supply chain. So a supply chain is nothing but everything that takes place between the raw produce, the raw products, to a packaged product that reaches the consumer. Here, I want to take the example of coffee, which is one of my favorite beverages. So if you really look at the process that takes place all the way from collecting the beans till it is packaged and delivered to you to make a delicious cup of coffee, there are multiple stages. First, the beans are collected and they get exported because not every country, every region can grow coffee beans. They come from different parts of the world. My favorite is the Ethiopian coffee let's say the beans get exported from Ethiopia to the rest of the world and a lot of countries and a lot of chains of uh, coffee shops import that and then they process these beans by roasting, grinding and applying flavor to enhance the overall taste and then it gets into the packaging mode and finally it makes it to the store or the coffee shop and then it reaches the consumer. As you can see, there are a variety of steps and stages in this supply chain. Basically, from the time the beans are collected till it reaches the consumer. Now, in this scenario of coffee, it is fairly straightforward because we are sourcing the coffee beans from one country or one exporter. And it is a very straightforward, simple process to understand. But if you extrapolate this and take a look at more complex supply chain, for example, a car, let's think of Toyota or uh, Ford. Now, obviously, the car manufacturers don't build everything in-house. For example, they outsource the manufacturing of engine to a different company. They basically buy the engine from a different company. 
the body parts and the overall frame, the chassis and all of those are, again, they are coming from a different manufacturer. And tires are made by a different company. Now, interestingly, within these components of the car, they have their own supply chain. Now, after they finish their supply chain, they export it to the car manufacturer and it gets into packaging where the car is assembled and then it goes to the showroom where it gets sold and the consumer drives away with the car. This is slightly more complex. Why is it complex? Because unlike the coffee beans, we are now dealing with multiple suppliers who are delivering a variety of components and these components are assembled along with some of the components that are made in-house by the car manufacturer or the car brand. And then these in-house components and the third-party components are all assembled together as one unit, which is car in our kits, and it is sold to the consumer. So this becomes slightly more complex. And it also brings in some challenges. For example, the car manufacturing company has to ensure that the quality of every component that they are importing meet certain level. And if anything is compromised, for example, let's say the car company is sourcing the airbags from a third party, and there is a problem with the airbags, which is discovered later, then it costs a lot of money and the reputation for the auto brand. They have to recall these cars because they cannot compromise the security of the passengers and customers. So they have to ensure every supplier that they are sourcing the components from are meeting a certain level of quality bar before they decide to integrate those components with their product. As you can notice, supply chains tend to get pretty complex and they, are, they become more and more complex and complicated when you have more than one supplier. But where are we talking about supply chain here? And what does it mean to DevOps and modern software development and deployment? Before I talk about that, I want to bring up certain principles called the lean manufacturing principles from a consultant now who, who lived in, in the mid 90s, basically from 1920s onwards, he was an expert in optimizing supply chains, manufacturing, and he was the most sought after consultant for various companies in helping them with quality assurance and optimizing their processes and supply chain. So he is Edwards Demi. You can find his profile on Wikipedia and you can read about his principles, but he created, basically when he consulted for Toyota back in mid nineties, he suggested four key principles for Toyota. First thing is use better and fewer suppliers. This is very important. So they have to make sure that the suppliers that Toyota is including should be very few because they can control and they can ensure better quality. And from those suppliers, Use the highest quality parts or components. First of all, reduce the number of suppliers and then ensure that the components that these suppliers are exporting are of high quality and resolve defects early and never pass known defect downstream. Now, this goes back to my airbag example. If Toyota figures out that the airbag is defective, but they overlook that defect, and go ahead and fit the car with those airbags. It's a huge risk to the life of the passengers, customers, the, the brand and the reputation of Toyota. And it is also going to be very expensive to recall all these cars. So they have to resolve defects very early in the cycle and never allow any defect to get into the downstream. Downstream is basically a concept where it is going to the consumer. Upstream is where it is assembled and downstream is where it is used by the consumer. So it, in the upstream, if there is a defect that is found out, you now either by the original OEM, they're called the original equipment manufacturers. If they figure out there is a problem or if 
the card manufacturers figure out there's a problem, they should stop the process and they should halt it right away and stop passing it on to the downstream, which is the consumer. And finally, create transparency and track what you use and where you use. This is very important. Internally, they have to maintain some kind of a checklist, some kind of a bill of material that says the tires are coming from this supplier, the engine is coming from this supplier, AFACs are coming from this supplier, and they have to maintain this really well, and they have to track and, and keep this up to date. If they switch a supplier, this single source of truth should get updated. These are the principles of lean manufacturing from Edward Demings, which was defined in you know, early 19, the last decade, 1930. But even after so many years, these are highly relevant and uh, these are still being reviewed and applied by a lot of auto manufacturing companies. Now is the time to talk about the software supply chain. So till now, I have spoken about what is a supply chain and what, is, what do we mean by upstream and downstream? And then we looked at some of the core principles of lean manufacturing. Now, let's compare and contrast that with how we build software and how this is relevant. Actually, if you look at modern software, just like a card manufacturing company is sourcing multiple components, we are also sourcing a lot of components when we are building the software. For example, when we are developing, let's say, a dashboard for tracking finance, the stock trading application, and you want to log, you don't want to build a logging agent from the ground up. So you will source a login component from either a commercial vendor or an open source project like Log4j or FluentD or FluentBit. They are open source, but they can be commercial as well. Similarly, when you are building the interface, your application is going to be based on a popular framework, let's say React or Angular. These are again open source, but you can also go ahead and buy some of these widgets and components and the interface elements, the user interface elements from a commercial company. And then you want to build APIs. So there are a lot of frameworks available. For example, if you are coming from a Python background, uh, you would go for GUnicorn or Flask or Django. So you will assemble all these components into your application. So your application is now an assembled entity of a variety of open source and commercial components. And then it gets developed, it gets packaged, and finally it is sent to the sales and marketing team, and it gets sold either through a SaaS-based form or as a desktop or a mobile application. It hits the app store, it, it, it hits the consumer channel, and somehow they'll start using the application. So here we have, again, two different sections. One is upstream, the other one is downstream. Upstream is where the core components are being built. For example, when you are consuming Log4j or FluentD, that is upstream. You now someone is building it for you. And because you are the consumer, it becomes a downstream. Now, this is a terminology that is very often used in open source. For example, when we say upstream Kubernetes, it is literally Git cloning the Kubernetes repo available on GitHub. That is upstream, not the core, the single source of truth. And then let's say we clone that repo or we fork that repo and we add additional components, then it becomes downstream. But for someone who is forking your repo or cloning that repo, you are the upstream and they become downstream. So you see how the chain is evolving, right? So this is a terminology that you need to understand. And this is very often used in the context of open source because we consume a lot of open source software when we are building our applications today. It is literally impossible to build any meaningful application that doesn't have an open source component. And these open source components are in turn based on many other open source projects. So it is actually a chain. That's why this is called as a software supply chain. 
a developer sitting somewhere writing a piece of code, deciding to open source it, adding a license like Apache 2 or MIT or FreeBSD license and committing that to Git repo. And someone loves that, they start contributing and someone decides to enhance it. Someone uses that as a part of another open source project and then it finds its way to very different, unpredictable places and areas that the original developer didn't even think of. That is how the modern software is evolving. Now, applying an official DIA and a variety of other sources, a software supply chain is composed of the components, libraries, tools, and processes used to develop, build, and publish a software artifact. Now, this becomes very clear. This definition is making sense because a supply chain, a software supply chain is a collection of various entities along with the process to build and publish a software artifact. Now, this artifact is basically the unit which is going to be consumed as is or could be consumed in other downstream projects. And we'll talk more about artifact in a minute. But if you are a library developer or a framework developer, your artifact is actually a library. If you're a developer who is building a web application, your artifact is basically a deployable web app. It doesn't matter where you are in the supply chain, you ultimately end a part of supply chain with an artifact. That is important to understand. Now, modern software that we build today is highly modular and composable. Now, what do I mean by that? I've been in the industry for about 30 years. I, I wrote my first line of code in 94. It makes me feel very old, but back then, writing software was very different. You would make a decision upfront that you are going with a specific vendor. And back then there was Power Builder, there was Visual Basic from Microsoft, there was Delphi and very few choices. And then you will completely invest in that, both in terms of your dollars by buying this and also the code that you start writing. Now, 30 years later, today, software is not about all or none approach. You know, it is not about picking one platform and going after a specific vendor or a platform. It's not Windows versus Linux or Java versus .NET anymore. A lot of software today is assembled from components. And these components are basically the SDKs, the libraries, JAR files, WAR files, DLLs, just to name a few. And then thanks to containerization, we have the OCI images. And more recently, we started to see the WASM, the WebAssembly modules that are also becoming a unit of deployment. So those are the new container images. And they become the artifacts. The artifacts are nothing but source code that you write, the binaries that you compile, even the design documents that you commit in Markdown on a Git repo, the models, the software models, and also machine learning models, even wireframes and mockups, all of them are artifacts. And these artifacts are ultimately packaged. Some of the examples of packages that we deal with are Node.js packages available in the form of NPM or even a tarball, which is a very standard way of packaging your software or a Python package that makes it to the PyPy repo or a Docker image that is stored in a registry or a Red Hat package manager, which is RPM or a Debian Ubuntu .deb file. All these are packages. So today, software is a collection of everything that you see here. You are basically assembling your application like the way you build a shape out of a set of Lego blocks. This is opening up quite a few challenges. It is not coming from single source of truth. Now, as they say, you don't have one neck to choke. You are dealing with very diverse set of open source and commercial software. It is very risky. Now, what are the risks and, and challenges in the modern software supply chain? The first one is called the vulnerability. Right. So vulnerability is someone who developed a piece of open source software or even commercial software and ignorant about a backdoor or a possible 
attack vector that can open up unwanted access to your code or the upstream code is a vulnerability. This is not something that people do intentionally, but because of an overlook or because of a genuine problem, a genuine issue with the development, a vulnerability might just creep in. And it may be discovered at a later point when a hacker or when someone you know, exploits that vulnerability and causes a havoc. So vulnerabilities are basically those backdoors or overlooked holes in the software that open up a backdoor in order to hackers and malicious users or even malware. Then there is intentional malicious attacks. Now, I'm going to talk more about this, but if someone wants to poison open source, it can be done in a variety of forms. For example, someone gaining access to an open source developer's workstation can inject malware right into his source code, which he doesn't even detect. So he commits that code and that code has malware. Now that code has a backdoor. And once it goes into an artifact registry and becomes a package, it is going to be distributed to, let's say, millions of downstream users. And then because of the backdoor that has been injected into the open source software at the developer workstation level, it now makes its way to millions of computers. And this is a very risky threat. And the malicious attack is not just confined to injecting poisonous code into the developer's workstation. Remember, in the supply chain, this can be done at any point of time. Because today, source code is traveling at a much faster pace and it is changing multiple hands as it goes through. Unlike the traditional supply chain, in traditional supply chain, you, for example, the coffee beans are put in a container and sealed. And if the seal is broken, that means it has been compromised. Now for open source, you cannot put a seal and you cannot really make sure that it is completely sealed. That is not the philosophy of open source. So that's why software supply chain is much more vulnerable and much more, it's easy to inject these vulnerabilities or intentional malicious code into the software. And then compliance. A lot of governments and a lot of enterprises now have certain regulatory and compliance definitions and policies that say, if you are using open source software, then you have to disclose everything and you have to tell us what you are consuming and you have to walk back. For example, if you are consuming, let's say, a logging agent, now figure out what else the logging agent is consuming and walk back, figure out everything and then show us that there are no vulnerabilities and this is a useful or this is a secure way of consuming the software. So it, it is even becoming a compliance and regulatory issue by governments and large enterprises. So now coming back to Deming's four principles that I introduced in the one of the previous slides. Deming's quality principles, how are they applicable in software? Use better and fewer suppliers, right? That means... What it basically means is, we'll take a look at each of those. So what it basically means is, when you are consuming open source or commercial software, make sure there is a basic hygiene in place. And you are actually getting this from an authentic, authorized, and verified source. You cannot really do a Google search. Let's say you are building a component or a user interface. You did a Google search for a drop-down component and you found a pretty cool Git repo that has the source code and also they have a given live examples and a live site showing all the elements and you really love that framework. So you clone that repo and you quickly import that package into your code and you have that only to realize this code that you git cloned and consume as a huge vulnerability or a known threat that creeps into your code. So you have to be very cautious 
in consuming software from unknown, non-verified sources. That's why you have to use better and fewer suppliers. I'll talk more about that in a minute. And you have to resolve defects very early in the cycle. That is basically building quality into everything that you're shipping. So the second principle is making sure that from these fewer suppliers, you are getting the highest quality output. So how do you do that? You basically make sure that there is a quality control applied at various milestones of this product and uh, use quality parts that you are actually sourcing. So that is all about version control. When you use version control, it's very easy for you to roll back. It's very easy to point people to a stable build or a nightly build. And you can create some kind of a chain of authority where you can create a pull request and you can basically use the source code control management to your advantage. And finally, transparency. Track what you use and where you are using. So this is actually called as bill of material, which I'm going to talk in detail. So use better and fewer suppliers. Remember, I just gave you an example of what can potentially happen. You randomly stumble upon a Git repo, you clone it, and you start consuming it, and then you find a vulnerability. According to the state of the software supply chain report, the most recent version from Sonatype, there are 1.2 billion vulnerable dependencies downloaded each month. It is a whopping 1.2 billion dependencies. 96% of known vulnerable open source downloads can be avoided, which means using a different version or just checking the TVE database, more on that later. And, and just making sure that you are not intentionally or unintentionally consuming a vulnerable piece of code. A lot of those things can be avoided. So when you are sourcing your components, your software components, particularly open source, you have to figure out the update hygiene. You cannot really clone a repo that's not been updated for the last three years. That means the developer is no more focused on it and he might have used very old software dependencies that might be too risky. So you got to be very conscious of the timeline. You should take a look at the last commit on GitHub when you're cloning the repo. Project maturity is basically the thumb rule here is look at the GitHub stars. If you find a few thousands of GitHub stars, that's a social acceptance for this software project, for this open source project. So that's not, it doesn't mean the project is very mature, but that's the first thumb rule that you can apply. If you are, for example, cloning a report, just take a look at the number of stars and that gives you a sense of how mature this is. And number of maintainers, the more the merrier. If you have more number of maintainers, that means there is a set of developers committed to this cause and that should increase your confidence because if someone gives up, others will continue to deliver. And then other thing is release frequency. How often are they shipping code? How often are they building the artifacts and turning them into packages? Go to the release section of GitHub and see how often have they been shipping. Now that is a very good sign to figure out how fresh the open source project is and how often are they shipping. And finally, security. There are a lot of badges that you see on GitHub. So you can basically check for certain stamps and labels that give you the assurance and confidence that this repo is following some security best practices. More on that later. But these are generally the key quality indicators where you are consuming open source. Now coming to using highest quality components from suppliers, there are some rules here. Don't choose alpha, beta, or release candidate, but go for the most stable version. Don't upgrade to your vulnerable version. Even sometimes you're tempted because that is the most recent and the latest doesn't mean it is risk-free. So you've got to be very cautious and control the temptation to go for the latest. Instead, go for the most stable. When a component is published twice in close succession, Choose the, late, the latest version because even if it is released on the same day, go for the most recent one where the timestamp is the recent. That means they have done it for a purpose by fixing some issues. Choose a migration path others have chosen. Particularly when you look at GitHub issues, there is 
some kind of a community input that will give you a sense of what is the migration path from previous version to the current version and the future versions. To the version that the majority of the population is using. Again, GitHub Stars is a great example of you know, choosing that repo. And within that, you can basically see if you go to the, for example, the Python artifactory or any of these crowdsource artifact and package management utilities, Docker Hub, you can see the number of downloads. So the more, the better. So you can choose that. So always, if none of the above work, choose the newest version, but make sure it is not known to have any vulnerabilities. So that was the second rule. The third one is resolve issues early. Never pass known defects downstream. Now, this brings us to a very important concept called DevSec Ops. So we all know what is DevOps, where the development and the operations team work hand in glove to ship and manage software and releases. So DevSecOps is basically bringing security into the entire pipeline. So typically, traditionally, developers have never been accountable for security. Security was always left to the runtime or to the operations guys. That's no more the case because it all starts with developers. If a developer ends up importing a module that is vulnerable and has a malware, it starts from there and passes on all the way to downstream. We call this as ship left approach, where in a typical software style, we put things from left to right. Now, the production or the deployment is always on the right, and the development is always on the left. When we say ship left, we basically mean that the responsibility and the accountability of using secure quality software starts with the developer. It is not left to the testers or the QA engineers or to the ops engineers who come in much later. So shift left is basically making sure that as a developer, do I know what I'm doing? Do I know what components am I importing? And am I confident enough to use that in my software? So that is what DevSecOps and shift left approach is all about. Bringing security very early in the cycle and making sure that we are using the best practices and highest quality software right from the get-go. Finally, create transparency and track usage. Remember, I told you about the car manufacturer maintaining, let's say, an inventory and a master list of all the suppliers and the product that every supplier ships and the details of all the components that the supplier uses. At any point of time, when you double-click a supplier, you see the product, you double-click the product, you see all the components that the OEM or the supplier actually uses, and you can double click and triple click and go down into every detail. That is what is called as bill of material. This is present in cars, electronics, and food products. It is very common for us to pick up a product, turn it around, and look at the ingredients or look at the composition. So when you are buying anything, for example, you are buying peanut butter, and you are very cautious about having calories and sugar. So you basically look at the calorie count. You look at if there are added sugars in the peanut butter or is it just natural sugar. So that is the of material. Now, similar to this, it's very important for us to create a software bill of material, which is going to have the list of all the ingredients that make up the software application. Now, this includes component names, the license information, the version and the vendors. Think of it as the metadata about your software. Everything and anything that you are consuming to build your software is going to be listed in this s bomb, which is the software bill of material. Now, if you are not very familiar, I want to give you something that you know, all of us can relate to. Now, look at this Nutella. Now, if you turn around this bottle, you'll find this label, right? This sticker. And this actually tells us two things. Number one, it is telling us the nutrition facts. Now, the serving size is two tablespoons. Each amount of serving has 11 grams of total fat. Total carbs is 22 grams. There is one gram of fiber. There is no cholesterol, unbelievable for Nutella. And there is sodium, right? And then there are ingredients, you know, sugar, palm oil, blah, blah, blah. So now, when I look at this, if I have nut allergy, for example, I don't want to buy any product that has nuts and because Nutella has published it as hazelnuts, I will drop that because 
I'm allergic to nuts and I don't want to buy this. Now, disclosing this information is very important for food manufacturers and it is a, it's a compliance. It is a compliance issue. For example, the food authorities in India or US, in India, any other countries, you would actually see FSSL, which is the Food Safety and Security Corporation of India. They actually force every product, every edible product sold in the market to have this label. So this is actually called as kind of bill of material because it tells you every ingredient that is available within this product. Now, can you do this for your software? Can you basically list down all the ingredients that you're consuming and even double click and go two levels deeper and figure out the bill of material for your software? That is very difficult. So you need tools to do that, right? So that ability to double click and triple click and uh, reviewing all the components that you are using in a project and determining the potential risk is called a software composition analysis. So if you actually look at this graphic here, the organization has an outsource contract developer, there is a system integrator, and all of them are consuming multiple OSS projects. And in turn, this OSS project is consuming some other open source project and the chain goes on. But it is your responsibility to work backwards and navigate this entire chain. Remember, software supply chain and figure out the origin of this software and decide whether it should be a part of your organizational policy or the software that you're building or not. This is called software composition analysis. And this is a much more mature way of uh, defining the SBOM. This software bill of material is just a laundry list of all the components. Whereas a software composition analysis will also give you the risk attached in consuming the components listed in the SBOM. Now, translating all of this, it is a lot of theory. I know this would become slightly boring if we don't map it. So now I want to switch gears and talk to you about the tools that we can apply to implement secure software supply chain. So before, before that, let's understand typical CI, CD, continuous integration and continuous deployment pipeline. So developers write code and uh, they write tests and merge it to the branch, which is sitting in their source code repo. Now, this could be GitLab, GitHub, GT, any of those. Now, as soon as the code is committed, the build kicks in. Now, this build execution is responsible for integrating the code. Now, this is a part of continuous integration. So it integrates all the code. It pulls all the dependencies mentioned in the source code. And then it builds an artifact. Now, this artifact is something like a Docker image, or it can be a tar file, or it can be a Debian package, dev file, or an RPM. And it goes and sits in an artifact a registry. So this registry has versioned artifacts. And this is the single source of truth, where you have all the different versions of artifacts that came as an outcome of the build process. So every time code is committed, build kicks in, build generates a newly versioned artifact with a new hash key. And that new hash is used as a versioning mechanism and it gets stored. Now, once the artifact is generated and versioned based on some human in the loop and approval system, it makes its way to continuous delivery or deployment and it goes to production. So this is how software flows from a developer's workstation all the way to the production cluster or the production environment running in the cloud or in the enterprise data center or at the edge. So this is what is a typical CI CD pipeline. So the blue color, the yellow color, and the red color pillars are basically the continuous integration part of the pipeline. And the green colored one is the deployment pipeline. Now, when you put these two together, what you have is the CI CD pipeline. Now, there are a lot of attack vectors that can happen in the CI CD pipeline. Remember, I was talking about the developer's workstation getting hacked and someone injecting bad code. Now, this is the worst thing to happen because you are poisoning the code right at the source. That goes all the way from the developer workstation to the build process and continues further. Now, the second attack vector 
is bill modified bill yes. from modified source right now it's a common mechanism where the source code control a repository for example if you leak your github personal token or the key or the credentials someone can go ahead and modify the source code that you are actually committing so that is a very risky thing so protecting your source code control systems credentials is very important now the build system is actually a compute environment now it is a ubuntu machine or a debian machine where you are running jenkins or you are running some kind of an integration system a continuous integration system now if that machine where the build process is running is compromised someone is injecting bad artifacts or a bad source code into that it gets integrated and it moves to the next one again at the packaging level there could be another attack vector where you are actually enabling someone to upload a compromised package that actually looks very legitimate but it is completely malicious and someone has injected that into the package artifact we repository right so anyone who downloads from there now this is a classic example of an npm package getting hacked and uh, malware getting introduced or a python module which is deployed by a pip is compromised all of that happens in the package stage and then deployment is the cd part where someone will bypass everything and they push a compromised image now that is too risky because all the hard work that you have done so far it it becomes waste and someone is pushing a different image that makes it to the deployment and once it goes to production deployment now all the users are attacked or rather they are also vulnerable and they just inherit this entire thing so there are multiple attack vectors in the ci cd pipeline that we need to protect that we need to secure i want to call out a mechanism called salsa this is pronounced as salsa but it stands for supply chain levels for software artifacts now you can take a look at salsa.dev and this is a very well articulated very fine standard to secure the software supply chain now let me switch to my browser window and show you so this is the salsa home page so what is salsa it is a supply chain levels for software artifacts what is an artifact it is basically a binary or a package or an entity that is about to become a package ready for distribution so it is home for all the entities that are about to be packaged so these are the attack vectors producer is basically the developer or the organization the source code it gets built along with all the dependencies it becomes a package and it moves to the consumer and all these red exclamation marks are basically the attack vectors so you can understand more about this by visiting salsa.dev and they basically call out everything that we have discussed so far now basically the real world examples on how source code or the supply chain can get compromised so how do we avoid this they define some levels so they, and each level comes with a badge basically the entry level is called level 0 and this has nothing basically everyone qualify as level 0 no guarantees no requirements you start with level 0 and then you move to l1 where the provenance exists so what is provenance so provenance is basically proving the origin of software you can work backwards and figure out who is the genuine owner who produced this piece of code so that is called provenance now most of us are familiar with the land records and the documents that in a changing hands when property is sold and bought now if you buy a flat or if you buy a piece of land you get a set of documents called link documents so those link documents are they run into reams of paper no and when you go through those link documents what it basically proves is as far as the government knows the the register office knows this is how the ownership has evolved and changed 100 years ago XYZ was the owner and he sold it to ABC and ABC sold it to John Doe and John Doe sold it to someone else and you can go back in time and figure out the provenance so provenance is working 
walking backwards and figuring out the origin. So it is very important. So when you prove provenance exists, you basically qualify for L1. Two is hosted build platform. Now, build platform plays a critical role because this is where a lot of injection can happen and it is a very sensitive attack vector. So what this basically says is you should use a build platform that is ephemeral, that is immutable. You are not reusing a build environment that someone else has used to build their software. And they could have left over something that can interfere and turn your code into malicious. So you have to use a hosted build platform. For example, GitHub Actions, right? So when you use GitHub Actions, basically behind the scenes, GitHub spins up a VM and it puts your code and builds your artifact. And they don't reuse. Now, you basically create an ephemeral, immutable. Ephemeral is temporary and used only for that purpose. And it is completely toned down when the build is done. So you, when you use that, it is guaranteed that you get a fresh build environment and you are not reusing and inheriting any problems that the previous build uh, has encountered. So that is called the hosted build platform. The level three of Salsa is hardened builds. So here it is basically everything of build level two, plus it prevents from influencing one another, even within the same project. And it prevents secret material used to sign the provenance from being accessible. So this defines the authenticity and the origin, and it is completely hardened. The build environment is secure and it is completely locked down where you cannot influence the build process, even if the code is coming from the same project and same organization. So these are the salsa core levels, and that is how it is basically done. So now I want to quickly show you a demo, right? So I have, I'm using Google, by the way, salsa, one, Google is one of the core contributors to the salsa spec. There are other companies, but it is coming from Google and it is a part of the Linux Foundation. Entity that governs Cloud Native Computing Foundation, Kubernetes projects, and a lot of other open source projects. Google implements Salsa. So here, even if you're not familiar with Google Cloud Build and Cloud Deploy, this is the build pipeline. This is the CI part of the project. We are actually building a jar file and packaging that into a Docker image and storing that in the artifact repository. So here, what happens is you basically run a command called Maven deploy. If you're coming from Java background, is how you basically generate the jar file. So you are first turning your Java pipe code into a jar file. And that jar file is built into a Docker image. And that Docker image is pushed into Google Cloud Artifact Registry. And from there, it will find its way to the deployment target, which could be Kubernetes, which could be something else. This is the CI pipeline, right? The continuous integration pipeline. Now, this is well-defined. It is declarative. All it does is it takes some Java code. Okay, here I have a repo. It takes the Java code. Here you can see Java code being written. This is being built first into a jar file. And that jar file is then packaged as a Docker image. And that Docker image is stored in the repo. Now, once it reaches the repo, it gets deployed. So we have two clusters called the dev cluster and prod cluster. And we'll first deploy it to a dev cluster. And after we perform some tests, we move it to the production cluster. So this is the CD pipeline based on what is called Google Cloud Deploy. And this is based on Google Cloud Build. So the CI and CD maps. Now, I don't want to go through all these steps. It's going to take a while if I really perform the build and deploy process. But here, let me first show you the Cloud Build. So when I go to the Cloud Build dashboard, it shows me all the history of all the builds. So I have one of the builds and this build has generated an artifact and that artifact is stored in the artifact registry, which is nothing but a Docker registry. So now when I look at view, you can actually see that there are some vulnerabilities. Luckily, there are no critical or high vulnerabilities. And this meets Salsa build level three. 
Now, if you really look at this, why, why does it meet salsa build level three? Because there is the provenance that is already defined. If you look at the provenance, now the provenance proves that I built this. It, it basically associates my credentials and my GP with the artifact that I built and it is verified. Now, because there is provenance and it proves that Janakiram is the owner and he built this image, it automatically qualifies to become the Salsa level 3 maturity, right? So once it comes and sits in the artifact, artifact registry, so now when we look at the repositories, the image which came as an output of the build comes and sits here. Okay, so the cloud build has generated a Docker image and that Docker image is available here. So now this Docker image, again, shows the same level of vulnerabilities. Now, if you actually look at these vulnerabilities, let me pick up something that is very well known. The curl command that we are using here has some vulnerability and this even suggests how we can fix that or rectify that. Now, none of these vulnerabilities are critical, but there are quite a few. And by looking at the details, you can fix most of the vulnerabilities that that are reported by the Google Software Delivery Shield. By the way, this process that we are seeing is part of something called Software Delivery Shield, which is Google's way of doing the supply chain security. So now that is what is reported during the build process, which is a CI. Now let's go to deployment. Now here I have the prod cluster and dev cluster, which I have done through the cloud deploy. So I went to cloud deploy, which is my continuous delivery and continuous deployment service within Google Cloud. So here I have the dev cluster and prod cluster and I promoted after making some tests, like basic automated tests and function functionality tests and user accepted tests. I moved this to production cluster. So now when I look at the production cluster, so I go to Kubernetes engine and I have the production cluster and here I have something called security posture, right? So the security posture shows us how does it look like when we deploy the software. Now we are looking at the production environment and here it shows there are 14 concerns. Again, if you look at these concerns, they, these are all runtime concerns. Now pod container allows privilege escalation on exit. Pod container is allowed to run as root. If you see, these are all runtime. It's talking about pods, which means it comes at deployment. And then these vulnerabilities are peeping in from our build state. So you can actually look at this dashboard and figure out what are the workloads that are affected, how many clusters are we running, and what are the types of concerns, whether it is configuration related or actual vulnerability that came via the build and the source code. You can figure out all of this, and even you can perform fixes based on the recommendation. So here, you can actually see what are the configuration concerns, the details, and the affected workloads and recommendations to fix them. So this is how you basically perform your know, security when it comes to the software supply chain. So this is called the Google Software Delivery Shield. I walked you through some of these cloud core, cloud workstations, cloud build, artifact registry, cloud deploy, and then Kubernetes engine. This is the pipeline that Google does. And by the way, this is not just specific to Google. There are a lot of companies, a lot of cloud vendors that implement software supply chain security. I strongly recommend you take a look at Sona type software supply chain article series. I borrowed a lot of concepts and graphics from their tutorial. It's a fantastic resource. You just need to type Sona type software supply chain article series and you will hit the link. Google software delivery shield. The demo was based on that. Open Source Security Foundation, it is basically a body that defines how to secure, what are the best practices for securing open source and Salsa, which we just reviewed, the supply chain for software artifacts. So I'm over time. That brings us to the end of this session. I hope you found this useful. One line takeaway is securing the software supply chain is everyone's responsibility. It starts with the developer. It ends with the operations engineer and it is an iterative, continuously evolving process. Make sure you are following the best practices 
all the way from writing your first line of code till you deploy the application. I see there are some questions. Let me see if we can. There is a question from Abdul Rahman. Uh, can we verify or obtain salsa levels in other cloud platforms like AWS? So salsa is not really tied to a vendor. Think of it more like a level of maturity that you can achieve. But Google has integrated that with Google Cloud Platform, which means based on the level of maturity that your build and deploy process follows, it automatically puts that label. But I'm not sure if other cloud platforms will tell you whether your process is Salsa level one, two, or three. That level of integration, I doubt, but definitely for Google, because Google is one of the core contributors of the Salsa specification and the standard. They have integrated that with software delivery shape. Thanks everyone for attending. It is a very good participation. I see a lot of feedback coming in. Thank you so much. And I want to thank CodeCloud for running this webinar series. Stay tuned for the other sessions that are coming up all through this week.